Hello and welcome to another video in this series, Archaeology in Islam. My name is Dan Gibson and today we want to examine the question that viewers have asked about Muhammad in Petra. Let me start by saying that I am making these videos to answer questions that people have asked after seeing the documentary video, The Sacred City. If you have not seen that film, then please try to watch it as these videos will make more sense if you watch the film first. You can find the film in a dozen different languages on the Sacred City website at the bottom of the screen. In the documentary film, I demonstrate that the first Qibla direction was towards the city of Petra in southern Jordan. As we have discovered so far in this series, it appears that Petra, at one time, was also known as Mecca. Thomas Arts Rooney, writing in 887 AD, makes this very clear to us, as he clearly identifies Petra, and then he lets us know that he's speaking of Mecca, the Mecca, he says. We also noted that all of the mosques all over the world in the first hundred years of Islam pointed to this city in southern Jordan. If you want to explore those mosques, then visit the website The Sacred City and check out the graphical interface. It allows you to examine these mosques and to check the evidence for yourself. These, this graphical website is the latest evidence. We have also shown in this video series that the original Kaaba was located in the city of Petra. It is the ancient foundation in front of the large building known as Temple of Dushera or Qasr al-Bint. Some people imagine that the Kaaba would have been a very large, impressive monument, but that is not the case. At this time, it was a squarish looking structure, quite unimpressive. We learn from Azraki the exact size of the Kaaba building during Muhammad's lifetime. Earlier in this series, we measured the old foundation that is in Petra, and we discovered that it is the exact size of the original Kaaba building as described by Azraki. It was not square. Each side had a different length, and this foundation matches each of those lengths. And don't forget, every mosque at this time faced this building. From east and west, north and south, every Qibla faced this building. Very strong evidence that this is the original Kaaba located in the city of Petra. So if this was the holy city of Islam, the place where the first Kaaba was located, then the prophet Muhammad would have been born and raised in this city, in Petra. It was here that his grandfather was the keeper of the Kaaba and its grounds. Now today, the Temple of Dushera stands directly behind the first Kaaba. And we will learn more about this temple in future videos. But originally, back in antiquity, the Kaaba stood alone in this valley. And it was a house of worship for the children of Ishmael. This was the valley where Hagar wept and cried out to the Lord because little baby Ishmael was about to die. It was in this city that she found water in Zamzam. Before the time of Muhammad, the people of this city were pagans. They worshipped a variety of gods. And when we look around the city of Petra, or Mecca as some call it, we see the temples of Dushera and al Uzha. They are there in Petra. We see evidence of a god with three daughters. As I have said before, gods were represented by a square block cut in the rock, because God did not have a human or animal image. Here we see a carved god block in Petra. It is square. Notice inside are three smaller ones, representing a Dushara as the large block, and then the three daughters, Al-Uzza, Al-Lat, and al Menowat are the three smaller blocks inside. So Muhammad lived in a pagan city. He was born here, and he would have gone down these streets. This was his city. He would have stopped at temples along right. the way. He would have known who was buried in the various tombs. 
As we read Islamic history, it should become clear to us that before the revelation in the cave, Muhammad was a pagan living in a pagan city and worshipping pagan gods. As I say this, I know there are people who will object. One of those is Adnan Ibrahim. He insists that Muhammad could not have been in Petra because there were idols there, and Muhammad was so pure that he could not coexist with idols. You may have heard this argument, but here in this video, I would like to answer it from Islamic sources. These are not my own ideas. This is from Islamic sources, commonly used sources. First, there are numerous references in the Hadiths of Muhammad coexisting with idols. For example, Muhammad eats food offered on altars. Bukhari tells us this. Allah's Apostle, that's Muhammad, said that he met Zayd ibn Amr Nufail at a place near Balda. This had happened before Allah's Apostle received the divine inspiration. Allah's Apostle presented him a dish of meat. Zayd bin Amr refused to eat of it, and then said, I do not eat of what you slaughter on your stone altars, or ansab is the word he uses, nor do I eat except that on which Allah's name has been mentioned on slaughtering. So here is a story of Muhammad before receiving his message, having a plate of food that was offered to idols. Let's read some more. Another account. This one from al karkushi And uh, it regards pre-Islamic days. He says, The prophet slaughtered a lamb for one of the idols. This is uh, Nusub min al-Ansab. Then he roasted it and carried it with him. Then Zayd bin Amr ibn Nufail met us in the upper part of the valley. It was one of the hot days in Mecca. When we met, we greeted each other with the greeting of the age of Jahaliyyah, which in Nam Sabahan. Then the prophet said, Why do I see you, O son of Amr, hated by your people? He said, This is without uh, myself being the cause for their hatred. I found them associating divinities with Allah, and I was reluctant to do the same. I wanted the religion of Abraham. The prophet said, Would you like some food? He said, Yes. Then the prophet put before him the meat of the lamb. Zayd ibn Amr said, What did you sacrifice to, O Muhammad? He said, To one of the idols. Zayd then said, I am not one to eat anything slaughtered for a divinity other than Allah. So here we clearly read that in the time of Jahaliyyah, the prophet Muhammad slaughtered a lamb to the idols. It was he who slaughtered the lamb to the idols. Then there's the cave where Muhammad received his vision. This was a spot where young men went for religious devotion. It was in this cave where Muhammad received the uh, beginning of the Quran. Here, Bukhari tells us that the cave was filled with pagan images. Bukhari tells us, I was in the company of the prophet in the cave, and on seeing the carvings of the pagans, I said, O oh Allah's apostle, if one of the pagans should lift up his foot, he will see us. He said, that's Muhammad, said, What do you think of two, the third of whom is Allah? Now, the proposed cave in Mecca in Saudi Arabia today does not contain any of these pagan carvings. But the proposed cave in Petra has these carvings. Once again, it's all in my book, Early Islamic Qiblis. I urge you to read it. I hear there are electronic copies circulating on the internet. In his pre-Islamic days, Muhammad was surrounded by idols. This is why he had to cleanse 360 idols from the Kaaba. When he was chosen as a young man to place the black rock into the corner of the Kaaba, he doesn't object to the presence of other idols. There were 359 other idols in that place. In the end, it doesn't matter whether they were in Mecca or in Petra, there were still 360 idols in one place in that city, and Muhammad was there in that place. In addition to this, in volume 4, 
of his uh, Musnad, Ahmed ibn Hanbal tells us that Khadija, the wife of the Prophet, had an idol, an idol of al Uzza, in her house. In the Book of Idols, Hisham ibn al-Kalbi speaks of the Prophet Muhammad worshipping al Uzza. We have been told that the Prophet of God once mentioned al Uzza, saying, I have offered a white sheep to al Uzza, while I was a follower of the religion of my people. Ibn Kathir repeats this in his tafsir in, of on the Quran. Ibn Hanbal adds that the family used to worship it just before bedtime. Additionally, whenever Muhammad complained that he was affected by the evil eye, Khadija used to send for an old elderly woman, a sorceress, to charm it away. This was in the time of Jahaliya. So it seems to me that the teaching, that the argument is Muhammad would never have been in the presence of idols, is a rather modern-day Islamic teaching, not based on what the early records record. Perhaps whoever started this idea had never read the writings of the early Muslim writers. From what we read, I understand that Muhammad grew up in idolatry. He participated in idolatry. And he very slowly revealed Islam to the people, just a few verses at a time as he received them. There is no event where the entire Quran came down. It was just a little bit here and a little bit there. When something happened and the people needed guidance, then Muhammad uttered a new revelation from God. It wasn't revealed all at once. And so in the beginning, people wrote down the individual utterances. Often they were just a few verses or just a few lines. Some given here, some given there, some in front of these people, some in front of other people. Little bits and pieces. Some of these sayings were collected into groups and they were named. So you have things like the cow or the woman or the camel. These were the individual names, and people knew them by these names. It wasn't until after the death of Muhammad, during the lifetime of Uthman, that these bits and pieces were gathered together for what seems the very first time, and given the name, the Qur'an. Even after this, there were several more gatherings, and it appears that under General Hajjaj there was even further gatherings of the things that Muhammad said. So, it becomes evident that there was not a unified Quran. Not until much later, scholars have gathered together many different copies of the Quran, and some of them have different readings. Some of them do not have all of the verses. In some of them, they are in a different order. Some have different wordings in them. All of this comes from the origins of Islam, where Muhammad moved around the pagan city and he gave the revelations at various times to address different issues that he faced, little bits at a time. It wasn't until the Muslims moved to Medina that the formation of a Muslim society began. And so the Hijra was from Petra down to Medina. So did Muhammad live in a pagan city? The early writers say, yes, he did. He participated. Did Muhammad worship pagan idols before the cave revelation? The early Islamic writers tell us, yes, he did. So why are some modern Islamic preachers upset with this? It seems they have made Muhammad a perfect person, even before he had a revelation. You see, in their minds, Muhammad was something other than what the Islamic records tell us. We must go back and read the Islamic records. I find that very few of these preachers have read Islamic history. He wasn't perfect. The histories make that perfectly clear. Even after the revelation, he gave in to pressure and he said what is commonly called the satanic verses. How do you explain that? Look, 
I am not trying to dishonor the prophet. Not at all. I am simply trying to get an honest, historical picture of him from the early source materials. What does it actually say about the prophet? So, it shows, as far as I can see, that Muhammad lived in a city with a large pagan population. Was that city Mecca in Saudi Arabia? Archaeology says no. The mosques clearly demonstrate that they all pointed to Petra. Muhammad was born in Petra. He traveled from there to Syria on a camel caravan. Later, he escaped from Petra, which was known as Mecca, and he emigrated to Medina in Saudi Arabia. This is what the archaeological evidence tells us. And there's very little in the early records to challenge it. It is all about understanding geography and which city is referenced when the early writers call a city Mecca. I'm Dan Gibson, and this has been another video in the series Archaeology and Islam. Thank you for joining us.